He was a minister at day and a gambler at night. Many claimed he was a good man, others a devil in disguise. He led a double life which led to an unfortunate end. This is the tragedy of Reginald Joseph Froki. This is the story of Rex. Over 100 years ago, Rex lived his life differently from everyone else. He lived from 1889 to 1929. Mike Froki, my grandfather, agreed to tell the story of who Rex Froki was and how he lived his life. He gathered as much information as he could, but being over 100 years ago, some history was lost. Not much was known about his life during high school. Our journey starts where Rex enrolled into the military during World War I in 1916. There isn't much known about him before World War I. I'm assuming that he just grew up. He attended college as a sophomore at Westmire, Western Union College, which has ended up being Westmire College. He was listed as a sophomore in 1916. He served in the military from 1916 to 1917. He was a private headquarters company, 2nd Infantry. So he was in a headquarters group. Lucky for him, he served at headquarters as private of the 2nd Infantry. He would serve until 1917. A year later, he would become a junior at Westmar College. Westmar was located in Lamars, Iowa, my hometown. It closed due to lack of funding in 1997 and became the Plymouth County Museum. At age 24, years prior to attending college, he married a lady named Eva. Years later, when he attended Westmar as a sophomore, he was 29 years old. And one year later, his wife passed away. Eventually, 1922 came along, and he became a senior and was involved in various activities, including being invested in his studies. He was active at 32 years old in football, basketball, and he was studying for the ministry. In 1923, he married Clara Erickson. He was age 31. She was 40, and Rex was a supply pastor at the Plymouth Presbyterian Church. Then it was the Craythorn Church. The little town of Craythorn does not exist anymore. Not much is found for the little town of Craythorn. It was once a small town located near Lamar's, and on the map, it seems to be out in the middle of nowhere. Now that Craythorn no longer exists, it's what remains of the forgotten town. Moving on to 1925, Rex and his wife would then make an important decision. In 1925, they adopted Nathan, which is my dad, and Beatrice, they were aged two and four. The court, <coughs> courts had removed them from an abusive alcoholic home uh, Reuben and Alice Lane. As for why they were removed from an alcoholic home, it was due to Rex's double life. But what made him become this way? In 1926, he was a junior at the Western Union College, and he was also an announcer at KWUC, which was K Western Union College. I think he, he was the one that was instrumental in getting that thing started, that, uh, <coughs> that radio station off the, off the ground. 1927, he was listed as a senior in the Western Union yearbook. He was the student council president. He was 
active in athletics and also the radio station. He was 38 years old here. So far we know that Rex was a very ambitious man. He served in the military, remarried and adopted two children, went to college, became the student council president, was a minister, was active in athletics, and was even a manager of the KWUC radio. He was a well-respected man through the public's eye. So what made him lead his double life? During college, he also was manager of KSCJ radio station in Sioux City for a period of time. My dad remembered playing in the studio, and he thinks that this little stint in Sioux City led to uh, a double life for Rex, <coughs> where he was gambling and had a girlfriend in town. And the Roaring Twenties was notorious for its economic wealth, music, and of course, illegal activities. This was the era in which the black market prospered. The creation of the 18th Amendment was a push that made the black market come to be, increasing the activities of bootlegging, prostitution, and gambling. My great-grandfather Nathan believed that because of Rex's work at the KSCJ in Sioux City, he ended up becoming addicted to gambling and unintentionally getting involved with the wrong people within the area. Sioux City had earned the name Little Chicago, as the little town of Sioux City had the mafia in its streets and a heavy gambling issue. Despite the state ban of alcohol, Sioux City ignored the order for such activities and 4th Street became a den known as the Sudan. Because Rex was getting involved with such activities, he began to change. While becoming wealthy for the time, he ended up buying a unique car model, the Graham Page. It was the only one of its kind in the area. While he changed, his family grew nervous of him and what he was getting involved with. They, depending on who you talk to or what you read, and I'll explain it in a little bit, uh, supposedly he started robbing banks at that time. In 1927, Clara took both children, went to California, and considered divorce. She returned to Iowa six months later and she was covering his gambling debt. Rex was almost divorced and his wife seriously considered not ever coming back, but eventually went back to Lamar's anyways. With Rex becoming addicted to gambling, his wife started to cover his debts. Eventually, it wasn't enough. He was then driven to do something horrible. Part where He's basically caught robbing the bank in Sioux Center. And uh, Clara, his wife, always kept him in a nice car. He had, a, at that time, what was called a Graham Page. It was pretty high class, pretty high class car. And he drove that to Sioux Center and uh, went to the bank over dinner and there were four people in there so he took what money he could find and supposedly that was seven hundred and one dollars <coughs> and then locked the four people in the, that were in the bank into the vault People remembered the Graham Page car because it was unusual at that time. And it was a pretty fancy car. And somebody had looked at the registration and saw that it was registered to him and that there was an Illinois license plate over an Iowa license plate on it. So they pretty much knew who it was. And they, he did get out of town. He was chased. Uh, they did find him at home. However, uh, they 
could not arrest him at that time because there was some technical problems with the warrant. And of course he denied it. And evidently a group of vigilantes was on his tail from Sioux Center. And Sioux County issued a warrant. And so they were also after him. And uh, they chased him out to the farm just uh, a little west and north of uh, Lamar's. And uh, he gave the tenant there, one of their hired men, a lot of bills. It was about $423. And went into the barn and uh, shot himself with a 25 caliber pistol in the temple. <coughs> he was alive when they got him to the, to the hospital, but he died shortly after that. His death brought anger to everyone in the area, letting loose their anger on the chief of police who was investigating Rex. They blamed the police for Rex's death. The ones who were really at fault, though, were the people on 4th Street leeching off of him driving him to his death. And it was kind of common at that time that if they found a bank robber or somebody that was robbing banks or doing bad things, they would blame him for everything. So, <coughs> the um, After his suicide, it was discovered that he was the leader of four bandits who robbed the Orange City Bank. Uh, somebody said that was it, or he was the one, and of course. Then they had him taking part in bank robberies in Auburn, Dana, Gilmore City, Bassett, Esterville, Turin, Cherokee. So they Blamed him for all of those. It wouldn't go to court. He was dead. <coughs> there was even one article that's published in the newspaper about a bank robbery in Nebraska, and they suspected Rex of doing that one, but he'd been dead for a year. So, I guess it once they had that, then it was, he uh, robbed every bank in the, in the three state area, which really didn't happen. I personally think that he robbed one, and because of his ministerial background, he was a minister at the time. Uh, he knew he'd screwed things up and he committed suicide. He knew it was wrong, and, and uh, I don't know that he was a leader of a four bandits, or seems kind of, kind of odd to me. In summary, Rex was an ambitious man, a minister, and the owner of two radio stations, eventually leading on to become an addict to gambling, losing the trust of his family, being involved with the wrong people, drowning in his own gambling debt, leading to a robbery and eventual death. He was a good man, and deep down really was to the very end. May he rest in peace.